I wasn't planning on sharing with you a story, but let me do this, maybe in place of, of that. And I think some of that relates to what we're going to be talking about. So yesterday we had the opportunity to drop Adriana off at college. It was uh, an exciting as well as an emotional day. For dad, it was actually Friday night. For mom, it was Saturday. And I think the reason why for me on Friday night as Adriana just sat next to me and as I put my arm, my arm around her and as we spent a few minutes talking, here's, here's what I recognize. And one of the things that, that I was saying to her, I, I recognize that she is now in a place where she is now, in a sense, out from underneath our roof. And I talked to her a little bit about maybe habits. That as she leaves the nest, that the good things that we have set as an example for her, that she would hold on to those. And the bad things, those examples, those habits that we have taught her, that she would be able to let go of some of those things. And it's one of those things that you recognize now as a parent as you begin to release them, how our own children often reflect the things that we teach them, the habits that they've learned from us. And so our prayer would be that we would be a family that's reflecting what it means to have like joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, knowing that there are going to be those days when we fail, but at the same time saying those are the things that we want to hold on to and the things that we want our children to remember and uh, to take with them. And so uh, what I pray is that as we spend some time together this morning talking about how do we create the kind of habits that are going to make a lasting impact in our lives. And think about that with our own children. What are the habits that our kids are learning from us that they're going to take with them? I know then that as a father, as a parent, as a pastor, I want to be carrying, leading out in these things so that I'm setting a good example. And I'm praying that for all of us this morning that we too would be saying, what are those habits that I have in my life that I need to be either getting rid of or creating so that I can create lasting impact, not only in my family, but as well as in our church and for our community. And we know we can't do that on our own. We need God's help in order for us to do that. So as we jump in, as we spend some time together in God's Word, would you, would you just join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we come before you this morning, and one of the things that we are so keenly aware of is how desperately we need you. God, we know we can go to all of these other things. We can seek our own will and our own way. And we find out, Lord, that they end up leading us towards wells that just don't satisfy. This morning, Lord, what we pray is that we would drink deeply from you, from your Spirit's presence among us, that, Lord, we would see and hear and know something new about you, something new about ourselves, and, Lord, something new about how you call us, Lord, to better reflect you in our lives, in our church, and in our community. So, God, open our eyes so that we can see you. Open our ears so that we can hear you. And open our hearts and fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the course of the past couple of weeks, we have been working our way through a series of messages about developing the kind of habits that really are going to change our lives. We've spent some time talking about what does it mean for us to be a people who are seeking God's direction. We're talking about what does it mean for us to be a people then of fellowship. And this morning we're going to be picking up a couple of other pieces about what does it mean for us to have the habit of worship as well as service. 
you and I know that there are all kinds of habits that we have. That in the new year, maybe there are some things that we've said, some bad habits that we want to get rid of. Maybe some good ones that we want to start. So you think about things like maybe biting your fingernails, maybe texting while driving, maybe things that we turn to, maybe spending too much time online, maybe spending too much time doing some things that we shouldn't be doing. There's all kinds of bad habits that we have. I think about the example that I'm trying to set for my own children. I think about the example that was set for me growing up. One of the things that I experienced growing up is we were always late for everything. In fact, people would often tell us, you run on Klein time. We, we actually have some friends of ours from Florida who gave us a clock that says Klein time on it, and it's always behind, right? But here's the thing, as a kid growing up, we were late to every doctor's appointment, I was late to school, we were late to church. I can remember, so when we served our church in Pennsylvania, I mean, this is, the, the doors to the pews had long been removed, but it was one of those old churches that had doors on the pews. People would pay more for their pew to sit up front. I don't know if you would do that now, if we actually had to pay for their pews. And people are like, why? Because that's where the heaters were. So the heating vents were up front, so you wanted to be closer to the pastor, and plus all the heating vents were there. Now, they had long removed those, but I was thinking about that this week because as a kid, it didn't matter. We were always late to church, and my mom always wanted to sit up front. So we would make the walk of shame every single week week. I'm sorry, mom, if you're watching, uh, but it's true. She, she would want to sit up front, and so it would always be like during the first song or something like that, and we would walk our way in. So that's why, for me, I want to be on time, right? So this is kind of the opposite habit. Now, here's where good habits, though, can go bad. So I kind of function under that mentality that if you're on time, you're late, and if you're 10 minutes early, you're on time. Thank you. Except, I know in myself when you're running a little bit behind and you can feel yourself getting a little snippy and I'm grabbing the steering wheel. My family doesn't know anything about this, right? And, um, and you're grabbing the steering wheel and your, your knuckles are getting white and you get stopped at a light and now all of a sudden, you know, you're like frustrated and you're saying things. Because this is what I recognize is that this is a good habit except when it takes a turn towards some negative things. Now, we all have things that are like that in our lives, right? Maybe there are some things that are in our lives that we, that we want to hold on to, and maybe some things in our lives that we want to change. Of course, that would be a whole other sermon if there are things that come about because of your childhood that now you're living differently. That would probably be for an entirely different sermon, but I want us to be thinking about what are the types of habits that God wants us to create. We think about it with our health. We think about it with our finances. We think about it with our relationships with our families. So there's all kinds of things in our lives that maybe we, we see that we want to hold on to and some things that we want to change. But ultimately, what we've been saying over the course of the past couple of weeks together is what are the types of habits that you and I need to create that are going to make a lasting impact in our lives? What are the things that we need to be doing that are ultimately going to change not only our walk and our relationship with God, but the way in which we interact with one another and the way in which we share our faith with the world in, in which we live? And we've been saying all along that this is about taking baby steps. So often what happens when we see we want to make these changes, we want to go from here all the way over to here, and we want those changes to happen instantaneously. And when they don't, we get frustrated. And so we're saying that ultimately this is about taking those baby steps. This is about a long obedience in the same direction. It's saying, God, every day I want to be a little bit more like you. I want to be a little bit more like your son Jesus. And in those moments when I fall, I know that you're going to be there to pick me up again. And I'm going to continue walking this out. 
And so last week we spent a little bit of time talking about how you and I need to find direction. Because so often we can find direction in all kinds of different places. You know that you can find it online, you can find it on the news, you can find it from people all around you, but ultimately, is that the kind of direction that's going to lead you into a better place? How many of you find that sometimes you're following the wrong directions? And what we were saying is that ultimately it's about taking God's Word, planting it in our lives. That's the way in which we're going to find the most lasting sense of direction then we were saying, too, how you and I need to be in fellowship with one another. That ultimately, what Scripture says is that we are to be iron on iron for one another. The thing is, is iron can't sharpen iron if you're separated. That means we need to be in relationship with one another. We need to be sharpening each other, and that cannot happen in isolation. Now, I want to maybe go a little bit deeper in what that means for us to be iron on iron because oftentimes we think of fellowship as just being something that we do by hanging out with one another. But I want to be clear, it's not just about simply hanging out together, having a good time together, uh, something that you can do at the downtown or something that you can do at Cerulean. That's not what we're talking about. It's about how do we pour into one another in terms of our faith journey, in terms of who we are as a people, so that we are being made sharper. Now, here's what I want us to understand. I'm not making these things up. These aren't things that I'm just saying, okay, you know what, I want to pick some things out of the air that we will say, okay, this is the habits that we want to create. All of these things come about from Scripture. Now, we spent last week in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, the, the habits of the early church. I think the church so often has gotten away from these earliest habits and that we need to get back to them again. Well, this morning we're going to spend another week in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. So if you've got your Bibles, I'd love to have you open them up. Of course, you're going to be able to follow along on the screen behind me. And if you've got a Bible app too, go ahead and open that up. We want to make sure that God's Word is just illuminating our lives. And we're going to pick up at the 42nd verse again. Let's, let's reread this. Let's think of this, though, through the lens of worship and service, because that's where we're going to be this morning. Listen to what it says. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And I pray that God is going to take his word. He's going to bless it to our hearts and lives this morning. I want to invite you to leave this open as we continue to look at this. We're also going to be looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 13 to guide some of the things that we're going to be looking at together this morning. You know, over the years, I can remember driving in our car and out of the blue, this is what I love as a parent, as a pastor, I I love how all of a sudden in the back of the car, you'll hear one of the kids say, I love our church. Like, ah, that's great. And I'll often ask, like, well, why do you love our church? And and their answer always, because my friends are there. You're like, that's great. I'm glad that you like it because your friends are there. I said, why else else do you love our church? And they'll say, because I get to play in the gym afterwards. I'm like, that's great. I, I love that you get to do that too. I said, well, why else do you like church? And they said, well, because we get to go to worship. It's like, okay, that's great. I said, well, why else do you like church? And they say, because we, we get to worship Jesus. And that, and that brings joy to my heart as, just a, as a parent. And I know that Jesus is the Sunday school answer, right? You know, it's Jesus. That's always the answer. But I want us to think about, I love the fact that my kids are thinking through these things about what is it that they enjoy about church. 
And I think that it's often the case for us, too. We can come and enjoy the fellowship with one another for all kinds of different reasons. Maybe it's the time that we spend together. Maybe it's the time for coffee hour. Maybe it's the Sunday school. I mean, whatever it is, there are all kinds of reasons why maybe we enjoy our time being together. But I want us to understand that when we gather together in this way, it is different than simply fellowship. It's different than what you and I could experience if we were to go to Lucas Oil Stadium or we were to go to Soldier's Field. This isn't just a matter of us gathering together simply to be together. We have to understand that there is something that is greater that that is taking place when you and I gather. And so we're going to be spending some time talking about these two habits, the first being the habit of worship. I want us to understand what we're talking about when we look at Acts chapter 2. It's the habit of worship. One of the definitions that has always stuck with me, even from my seminary days, is the idea of that worship is where we enter into the presence of God, and in doing so, we find life. That, that's the definition that we were given. And it's always stuck with me because I understand that, you know, there is life, There is joy, there is hope that we find in this place that we cannot find anywhere else. By the way, why would the early church want to gather together every single day? Because they were finding joy. They were finding life. There was something about being together they understood that they could not get anywhere else. Notice what it says in verses 46 to 47. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. So they'd go and they'd gather there. They would break bread in their homes. They'd come back. They'd fellowship with one another. And they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. I mean, could you imagine if I said to you, every day we're going to gather just like that? But I want us to understand, the reason that they did that is because they found hope, they found joy, they found life, they found things that they found together in God's presence that they know they could not find anywhere else. Now, I want to unpack this just a little bit this morning, and there's five areas here when we think about worship that I want to explain. And the first is this, worship is about giving God worth, all right? It's about giving God worth. You know, one of the ways that you could define worship is really worth-ship. Whatever you, whatever you give your time to, whatever you give your energy to, your finances to, your focus to, ultimately, that is what you worship. You say that this is worthy of my time. This is worthy of my focus. This is worthy of my energy. And so what we're saying is this is what, in a sense, I worship. Now, when we think about that, what does God say? In the Ten Commandments, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. It's the first thing that God lays out. God is saying himself, I alone am worthy of your worship. All these other things that call out to you, they are nothing compared to me. And so it's important for us to understand that when we gather together, we are not worshiping an orator's words. We're not worshiping a a team as they lead us. In a sense, what we have to understand is that we are worshiping this almighty God who loves us, who cares for us, who has given us a son and a savior in Christ. And so because we are a people who recognize that we have been redeemed, we gather here. We say, God, you alone are worthy of my worship. I want us to see in the Old Testament, we're going to bring in First Chronicles here, but I want us to see in the Old Testament, David is leading this procession of people. They're bringing the Ark of the Covenant. They're placing it back in its place. And as David is leading the people, think about what he says. He says in First Chronicles 16, 25, for great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared among all gods. And you want to see a sense of David giving God worth. 
He says, God, you alone are worthy of my worship. And because of that, God, I'm going to come and I'm going to fear you, but I'm going to give you my praise. Notice the second thing is that worship is about giving God focus. It's about giving God our focus. You know, I'll say it is a fine line that pastors and worship leaders, anybody who's speaking in the life of a church often, it's a fine line that we walk. Now, what do I mean by that? It's because we want to do things with excellence. We want to do things well. But the danger is, if you do things too well, the focus is on you. That's where pride comes in. If you do things too poorly, the focus is also on you. <laughs> because they're like, wow, that really stinks, right? And so what you have to do is we, we try to say we want to do things well and we want to do things in good order, but ultimately we want to be transparent. It's, it's kind of like a, a referee at a game, right? You don't even want to know they're there. It's that they're managing the game well, but ultimately what we have to say is we want to be transparent because we don't want you to focus on us as good or as bad as we may be doing, as I may be doing right now. That's not what the focus is supposed to be on. We're to be transparent because ultimately we, we want you to see God. Now, that's what I'm thinking about when I'm worshiping. When I'm leading in worship, it's like, okay, God, I recognize ultimately I'm preaching for an audience of one. And so I want to make sure that in what I'm saying, I'm honoring you. That's my focus. The question is, what's, what's your focus? As you sit there, is it, well, I'm kind of sneaking it up today. Oh, that's really good. Or is your focus on, yeah, you know, I wonder how the Browns are going to do today. You know, I'm thinking about where I'm going to go to lunch. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, am I going to do grocery shopping this afternoon? I mean, see, our focus can be in all kinds of different things. Now, the danger is you weren't thinking about any of those things until I told you about those things, and now you're going to be focused on them. But I want us to be thinking about where is our focus? when we come to, to worshiping God. And we say, God, in this moment, you alone are what I see. Notice what verse 26 says in First Chronicles. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. If you understand that all the other things that draw our attention and our focus can be idols, and then we say, God, I want you alone to be worthy of my worship. What it does is it, it, it focuses our focus on the one who alone is worthy of our worship. Third, it's about receiving God's love and giving God our love. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing when you and I gather together. We both receive God's love, but then also have an opportunity to share and to say, God, I love you. Think about what Deuteronomy 7, 9 says. Know, therefore, that the Lord is your God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and who keep his commandments. We know God is faithful to his promises. He is loving towards all he has made. We know. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. We know. According to Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to know that before you or I could do anything good or bad, God loved us. He loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, that you and I, as we come into this, into this place, as you and I just come off of celebrating Christmas together, as we look forward to the promise of Easter, we come, it's all because of God's love for us in Jesus. Now, 
when we understand God's love for us, what's the response? It's to say, God, I love you in return. You know, if you say you love your spouse or you love your children, you put the time into it to say, I want you to know that I love you, that I care about you. And these are the things that we do. When we come to worship, we are saying, God, I give you my time. I give you my focus. I give you everything that I have. And these are the things that we need to be thinking about, the habits that we need to be creating to say, God, you alone are worthy of my focus and my time. Fourth, notice we give God our praise. We give God our praise. Notice the Bible talks about bringing God the sacrifice of praise. Now, what is that? It's the fruit of lips that continually bless God's name. And we know that we not only have an opportunity to praise God when we're in this place, but here's the hope and the prayer, is that the praise that we give to God in this place would be what we carry with us throughout the week, right? We don't have to bring God just the sacrifice of praise on a Sunday morning. It's the fruit of lips that continually bless God's name so that each and every day as you and I are living our lives, as we're walking through life, we can bring to God our praise. Notice what David says in 29 and, verses 29 and 30. He says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord and the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Here you see David bringing to God the sacrifice of praise, and he's saying, I am going to do this continually, all the time. And then fifth, in worship, we get God's strength. We get God's strength. You know, here's the great thing about worship is that when you and I enter into the presence of God, I said, we find life. We find hope. We find joy. We find God's strength. Verse 27 says this, Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. So when you and I gather here, we're able to take all of our cares, all of our concerns, give them over to God, and we find God's strength. And when we find God's strength, you and I receive joy. Notice what verses 34 to 35 say. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Cry out, save us, God our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Now, I want us to understand that you and I, when we gather to worship, it is not simply to get something from God. God is not some cosmic genie that you think, oh, I'm just going to rub this lamp and God's going to say, what is it that you want? Okay, okay, okay. But here's the thing we need to know is that there is something that happens when you and I gather together in worship. We're not manipulating God, but when we offer to God the sacrifice of praise, what ends up happening is we draw strength from that. We realize God is in control. And though there may be so many things that are happening in my life, that may be happening in our world, I am trusting that God is in control so I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to live in worry. Instead, God, I trust in your strength that you are going to provide. Now, just imagine for a moment if we really incorporated the, the habit of daily worship into our lives. How do you think your life would be different? Or your family? Or your work. I believe that God is calling us to incorporate a healthy habit of frequent worship into our lives. Now, we could probably spend all day talking about that, but I want to spend a little bit of time as well seeing what we see in our passage, and that's the, the habit of service. All right? It's the habit of service. Our passage says this, all the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. 
You know, there's something about this that's like just so beautiful. If you think like every day they gathered together and then they would sell their possessions, they would give to anyone who had need. You know, oftentimes uh, the Amish can be portrayed as maybe a little different, a little weird, but here's the thing. They get it in terms of worship and service. Like when you talk about an old-fashioned barn raising, you know, where the whole community gathers together and says, we're going to get this done. Uh, there, there's something about that that's attractive, and that's equally what was attractive in the life of the early church. People saw the way in which they generously, frequently gave to one another, and people started to say, that's what I want. I want that for myself. And so we see this, this idea of worship as well as work. My sense is that the world can sometimes see the church as being stingy. As always having our hands out. But when we remember, what did Jesus say? For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. I think we learn a lot from the early church if, if we begin to look at our lives as one of service where we say, God, you know what? I, I want to give because I recognize Jesus has given everything to me. What would it look like if you and I began to incorporate this habit of service into our lives? I, I want to give you a little illustration. So Roger, Meg, if you want to come on down, stand, stand right here in front of us. All right. I know I told you a little bit ahead of time what to do, so. All right, sit right here. Okay. Oftentimes, this is the way in which people look at the church. This is the way in which people can often come into the life of the church. This is a church, if we put it under a microscope, where people are saying, well, what can you do for me? Well, what are the programs that you have? How can I plug in to the life of the church? And I want you to be very clear, this is what church people look for, okay? Because we want to know, well, how's your music program? Can I get involved in that? Well, what does your Sunday school ministry look like that? How can I get involved in that? And it, it's this, what can you do for me? In my life in ministry, unchurched people don't care about this stuff. What they care about is the fact that you love them. This extra stuff is what, it's a bonus, right? See, whenever we treat the church like a vendor of religious goods and services, saying, what can you do for me? If we treat the church like a Kroger or a Walmart, we're looking at the church in a way that is not as God intended. Instead, this is how God calls us to look. You know, if, if you think about a butler who, whose call is to serve, someone who says, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? This is how God calls us to be together as a church. This is a church that is saying, I don't, I don't care about being served, but I want to serve. I want to follow in the example of Jesus who said, I, I didn't come to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. This is the type of church that is going to have a profound impact in the community. This is the type of church that when you and I choose to live this way, not only are we going to grow in our fellowship with one another, but this is the kind of thing that people in our community are going to see and say, I want to be a part of that. In my life and in my ministry, even in our church plant, we saw this over and over again. People would say, well, I don't really believe what you believe, but you're doing this service project, and I want to join you in that. And we'd be like, come on, help us serve our community. And what ends up happening is through that, and as, these, as our people were serving together, suddenly they're like, you're doing this, why? And that's when all of a sudden you get to tell them about Jesus. And they're like, you know what? I want to be a part of a church that's like that. See, I want us to think, if you had the opportunity to be this, okay, or that, which would you rather be? Well, the people, our, our 
God is calling us to be a church that serves. And I pray that, that God would lead us in that. All right, thanks, you guys. You can go ahead and be seated. So, whew. <laughs> now, there's three things here. Notice first, we put our hands out. Okay? We're called to put our hands out. If we want to be a truly kingdom-minded church, we need to put our hands out and saying, God, what are you calling me to do? How are you calling me to serve? What is it that you want me to do and to be in with my neighbors, in the life of our church, in our community? What, God, what are you calling me to do? I want us to think, what if we saw our church as a mission outpost? Where people come, they're trained, they learn, they grow, and we send them out. And that's what we want to do. We want to provide a training ground for service. Notice the second thing is we put our hands up, right? You know, you, you can have your hands at your side, you can put them in your pocket, or you can say, okay, my hands are out. I, I want to I serve, I want to give. And we put our hands up, and we put our hands up because when we put our hands up, it is, it is an act of surrender, saying, God, I, I need you. I mean, you think about your children. When they're little, they hold their hands up. They're like, Mom, Dad, help me, right? And that's what we're talking about. When you and I put our hands up, we're saying, okay, God, I surrender my life to you. I need you. And then what do we do? Our hands up lead to hands that are out. And hands that are out, we recognize, I can't do it on my own, and they they lead to hands that go up and saying, God, I, I need you. And so this is that where you and I just need to be constantly thinking about this. In Hebrews 13, 15 to 16, it says, Therefore, Jesus, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So here's the habit of worship where we gather, we're offering the sacrifice of praise, and then this, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. This is that second part. So we not only offer to God our worship, but then we offer to God our service. And we say, God, this is how I want to serve. I love how these two things are tied together. What did Paul say? Whatever you do, whether in work or in deed, do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You and I are called to worship and to work. To follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we do these things not because I'm telling you to. Not because you feel guilty if you don't. But because you love Jesus, and you want to live your life as an example. We serve in faith and out of faith. And what happens? Here's what happens. Serving others is about salvation. It's about salvation. I want to be clear, I'm not talking about working out our salvation, right? Working out our salvation with fear and, and trembling. This is about living our lives in such a way so that Christ can be known, that the way in which you and I live and serve, that when people see the way in which you and I live, they say, I want to be a part of that. Over and over again, I have seen that, that the way when you choose to live a life of service, people are like, that's, that's different. And whatever that is, I want to be a part of that. And over and over again, we've seen people say, well, I don't really get this whole God thing, but man, I, I am ready. I, 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 want, I want to commit my life to Christ. And when you and I choose to follow in that example of saying, just as Christ came not to be served, but to serve, when you and I serve, here's what happens, is other people get to hear the good news. And they too can come to that place. I, I want us to see, you know, so often we hear about we bring joy to our city. But I want us to see what our full mission statement says. We've been studying this together in session. I've been asking a lot of questions about it. What do we mean by these things? But transformed by his grace, 
we seek to hope only in Christ, to show him as beautiful, and to bring joy to our city and the world. Something about worship and service that are tied together here. When you and I come to that place where we recognize we have been transformed by his grace, grace through faith in Christ, what begins to happen is then we say, you know what, I want to show him as beautiful. And as you and I show him as beautiful, what happens is we seek to bring joy to our city and our world. Do you show joy in the way in which you live? Do people look at you and be like, there's something different about you because of your joy, the joy of Jesus? And they say that that's what I want for myself as well. You know, I can remember a number of years ago, I'll close with this. I can remember a number of years ago, um, the church that we were serving up in Pennsylvania after Hurricane Katrina, uh, we sent some uh, team down to New Orleans. And one of the things that one of the people in the community said, and this has always, when I hear the story, it has always stuck with me. They said, you know, you, you won't hear about it in the media. You don't hear about it on the news in any way. But he said, you need to know it's the church that's rebuilding New Orleans. He said, it, it, it's not the Army Corps of Engineers. It's not the, the money that's coming in from the government. He said, tens of thousands of churches have come down here. And tens of thousands of people have given their time, their energy, to spend time rebuilding this city. And he said, this is, we will not forget. When you and I choose to live lives of service in that way, to say we want to be a part of a church that is not only a worshiping community, but is also a serving community, it impacts our community, and it impacts the world. And so, beloved people, my prayer for us this morning is that we would understand just as Christ came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, that you and I would choose not to look at our church and to say, how can you serve me? But to say, how can I be a part of a church that is serving others? And I love, I love the way that even in the midst of, of a pandemic, even in the midst of a lot of change, this church, you're still getting after it. You still want to be a part of serving, and I believe that God wants us to do even more. And that he calls us to be more, not for our own focus, not for our own glory, but for the glory of Jesus. So friends, may we be a people who pick up and run with the habit of worship and service. All for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and Lord, more than just a rah-rah rally cry, more than just, ah, let's get out there and do this. Lord, we recognize we need you to change maybe our hearts. Maybe there are some things in the way in which we have looked at the church and, and we think of it more as a vendor of religious goods and services. And so then, Lord, we, we think of it of, oh, how can we compete against other churches that are offering this or doing that? And to say, Lord, we don't want to get caught in those trappings. We want to do what you call us to do with excellence, but we want to be a church that is known for the way in which we serve. Lord, the way in which we've been asking in leadership is to ask, Lord, that if our church wasn't here anymore, would Warsaw, would Winona Lake even notice? Lord, we want to be about your business that, Lord, people would see and know when they hear of Presby that they would think of a church that is serving our community and ultimately that they would see and hear and know that Jesus Christ is Lord and that, Lord, when we come before him, he gives us joy, he gives us strength, all of these things, Lord, that we try to seek and find on our own that we find only in you. 
Lord, this morning, would you strengthen us? Would you increase our joy? God, would you do a work in us? So that, Lord, as we leave this place with hearts that are just overflowing with worship and praise, we'd worship you, giving you the praise all throughout the week. And that as we do so, Lord, we keep an eye bent towards those who have need. To be able to serve, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And maybe it starts with our families. Maybe it starts with our neighbors. Maybe it's our community. Whatever that looks like, Lord. May we be a people who are seeking to serve, not to be served, because we're following in the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And amen. Friends, I want to invite us to stand as we sing together. We do know that we have a story to tell to the nations. And because it is the greatest news, the greatest story in all of history, let's stand and let's sing this together.